1997, many readers fell in love with a man named Maury, who taught us some life lessons through the words of one of his former students in a book titled Tuesdays with Maury. Well, thanks to Maury's son, Rob, we're going to hear more from this beloved man, Maury, in a book titled The Wisdom of Maury, where we hear Maury's actual thoughts and words presented to us through the expert editing of his son. Our featured Meet the Author for December is The Wisdom of Maury with Rob Schwartz. Rob, we know Maury from reading about him. Can you amplify the Maury that you grew up with? Absolutely. First, I want to say it's such a pleasure to be here in Sunset. He's such a beautiful community, and I'm really happy to present to this particular community this book, which I think is so valuable. Um, so the Maury that I grew up with, I mean, I get this question a lot, and he was a really fantastic dad. I mean, there's a lot of stories from my youth, from my childhood, and one of them, because you know that kids never appreciate what they have. That's just across <laughs> the board, right? When you're a little kid, you think everything in the world for everybody is just like you, right? You never think, wow, other people have a very different experience than me. You never think that. So my father was a professor of sociology at Brandeis University, and he was absolutely beloved by his students. It's not an exaggeration, he really was. And I know this because they used to come up to me all the time and say, oh my God, your father is amazing. I mean, literally every time I was on campus, mm -hmm. this happened. Your father is amazing and I wish I had a father like him. And as a little kid, you know, you always have these tiny little frustrations and everything. And I would always think to myself like, oh, you don't really know, you know, he's whatever. <laughs> you didn't see there. him at breakfast yeah, this morning. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He didn't give me this or he didn't do this. And in retrospect, I can see that they were obviously 100% correct and I was just a little kid who didn't know anything and that was my reaction to it. But yeah, he really was a wonderful father, very loving man. Of course, he wasn't perfect. I would never try and paint anybody as a saint, but the thing that he really exemplified and I talk about, he talks about and I talk about in my presentations in this book is that he continued to grow and he continued to learn as he got older. So when I became like a teenager or even a young adult and the issues that I was interested in that his generation maybe didn't think about so much, like even big issues today that we kind of feel like everybody agrees upon, like sexism, that's not a thing that they thought about when he was growing up. It just wasn't an issue. So, I mean, I could give you some stories, but when we talked about it, he would take it on board. You know, a lot of people have problems taking new things on board, challenging their belief systems. He mm -hmm. would take it on board and he changed and he evolved into somebody who was, you know, extremely enlightened in stuff that came about long after he was well into adulthood. Now, the book, The Wisdom of Maury, yes. is actually something your dad was working on, and you worked on it with him for a short period of time, and as things happen, it got stored away, it was really, after his passing, kind of left behind, and you found the manuscript. That's right. That's so right. how did you come to the decision that this should be published? Okay, so first I got to rewind the tape because... Um, it's not exactly correct. I didn't work on the book with my father. This is my father's book. He wrote it from the first word to the last word. What happened was I was at home during a period. Most of the time he was writing the book, I was living by myself, working. I even moved overseas, and I'll talk about that in the presentation. But um, there was a three-month period where I was in Boston. It's the last time I ever lived with my parents. And this is like one of the periods he was working on the book very intensely. So I got to speak with him oh. and exchange ideas and listen to it. I was a very young man at the time. I was in my 20s, my early 20s, but he was still interested in how I perceived his ideas and what I thought that people would be able to relate to and would help them. So we had a big exchange, but it's completely his book. He's the author. I wouldn't say I worked on it at that time. So that's correct, what you said. He worked on this book from 1988 to 1992. Then he started to get ill. That's very well known. Right. With, uh, Tuesdays with Maury. He got ALS. It was a fatal disease. Mitch came back and, you know, spoke with him and was able to write this incredible book, Tuesdays with Maury, afterwards. And this manuscript, which is now The Wisdom of Maury, was put into a desk drawer and stayed there 
for easily 10 years or more. And I was traveling back and forth between Japan and Boston. I was living in Tokyo as a journalist. And I was in my father's study one day working, writing as I do. And I pulled open the desk drawer and I found the manuscript. And I knew immediately that we would have an opportunity because of Tuesdays with Maury that now we would have an opportunity to publish this. And um, I had a lot of work to do. So first of all, it was written over a four year period. So there's repetition in it. My job as an editor was to cut out the repetition, make it as readable as possible, but at the same time, maintain my father's voice. Mm. This is not my voice, it's 100% my dad's voice. And you know, he's the person that people are interested in because of Tuesdays with Maury, right? So I, the focus is entirely on him. And uh, I had to work with my mother, and I edited the book numerous times. Yeah. Now, who's the target audience for Wisdom of Maury? When my father wrote it, his idea of writing a book about aging creatively and joyfully was people over 55. I think this book is, has really <coughs> helpful <coughs> advice for people of any age. And basically, it's a book about how to live. He is aiming it specifically at people over 55 because he's dealing with those issues. But a lot of the things that he talks about, what's important in life, how do we live our lives, what should we focus on, they apply to everybody. Oh, but he is such a good cheerleader for those of us that are active agers. Absolutely. Uh, he really That's is. exactly what it's about. Now, I, I read that um, as you compared Tuesdays with Maury, with Wisdom of Maury, yes. that you felt that this book is more discursive. How so? Well, Mitch wrote Tuesdays with Maury in a very distinct style. Very, it's a very short book. The sentences are very short. He wrote it in this direct style, and it was very much intentional. And obviously, he did an amazing job, because that book has sold 20 million copies. It's considered the best-selling memoir of all time. I mean, just mind-blowing, right? This is about a guy who was not famous, you know, in, in the real sense, in the you know, TV right. sense, when he was alive, you know? Um, my father was a professor, so he writes longer sentences. He likes to make lists of things. He likes to discuss things from every angle, right? He'll mull over a concept. So that's very different than uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Tuesdays with Maury, Rich, Mitch writes one sentence, like Maury thinks this about this, and then, you know, he goes on to the next thing. This is really much more of a thoughtful piece that approaches things from different angles, um, considers different problems, you know. I did have to cut down the length of some sentences in some cases, but pretty much it's very readable and it's very easy to understand, but it's really kind of approaching things from a lot of different angles. A little textbooky for us to also think about, too. It gives us a lot of challenges, I think, as we read the book. Okay, if you mean it in that You're way. Right. I wouldn't no. consider this a textbook. No, not that. at all. Yeah. But he does have that beautiful nine-part framework yes. that he takes us through for our self-improvement. Yes. As you were working through the book, was there any particular section that resonated with you that you said, yeah, that, that's it, that's the target that we all need to look at? I mean, there's so much in this book, it's hard to focus on one thing. For me, it was more like, because he was my dad, it was more like some of the stories really resonated with me. Some of the stories were part of our family. Some of the stories are in the book I didn't even know about. A couple of places in the book he writes about me, which I was really surprised about. I didn't know that <coughs> until I started reading it and editing it. But yeah, I think, you know, there are techniques, and when I present, I list them out, boom, 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 that he suggests to people, and I think that's really the heart of it. A nine-part framework is a little long <laughs> for people. I list six techniques, they're a little easier to grapple, but obviously the book is so rich, and when people read it, I really suggest that you make you know, notes, add post-its, mm -hmm. and go back and read it again, and mull it. It's not the kind of book that you read once, like a novel. Okay, I read that. It's not that kind of book. You say that because I kept flipping back through. Absolutely. And I would be, I want to go back to that ages section. I want to go back to this section. Absolutely. So I had so much fun with it. Now, you have had your own challenging and energetic career. How was that transition to editor? Well, I was an editor. I've had, I've had a career outside of editing. I've done 
producing film, I worked in the music industry, I started a record label in Tokyo, but for 14 years I was a script editor okay. at NHK, which is the national broadcaster in Japan. They have an English language channel. So I have a lot of experience as an editor. It's not something that was outside of my professional realm before I did this book. Obviously, everything that I've done before this, pretty much, I mean, I, I founded the label myself, the record label, so, but I still worked with a lot of other people. This is a much more solitary thing. I had this manuscript, it was me, my mother helped me for a little bit in the beginning to get it kick-started, then it was me sitting at a desk editing it. So that that's a big difference. Everything else I've done, producing films, you work with a big team. At the TV station, I worked with a really big team. Um, so this is more solitary work. But of course, in some way, I feel like I'm sitting with my dad. So. Uh, I, that's the last question I wanted to ask you is, you mentioned all of your experience, but when there's a project like this that is so close to your heart and your, your head, yes. um, what were the positives and negatives? Well, obviously the positive was, and a lot of people have commented on this, that you know I could feel my dad's presence. It felt like he was alive and sitting with me. That's one positive. And of course, the other positive is that I learned a lot myself reading him. And I discussed the ideas with my father for a three-month period, but I didn't get it all right. So this, this, I learned a lot, and I, it's a very vibrant book. You feel very alive oh, while yeah. you're reading it. The negatives. Um, there weren't so many negatives, but you know, there's always things that you consider. My mother thought a lot about this, more than me. But you know, Tuesdays with Maury was such an incredible success. To, like, to release another book, it's like, well, you're never going to have that kind of success as Tuesdays with oh. Maury. If I had half of the success of Tuesdays with Maury, with the wisdom of Maury, I would be you know, thanking everything thanking God as much as possible right but the fact that I did worry that you know somehow this this book may detract and my mother worried about this more from the glamour the the prestige of Tuesdays with Maury but you know I, I don't really worry about that this is a fantastic book I know there's an incredible amount of invaluable information in there I know that it's helped people, that it's helping people now, so I don't really worry about it. Well, I think it's a great one for us all here in Sun City. I think it's just like like it could be our, you know, our, our oh, guiding words. So, so uh, and, and I wish he were here yes, to we, enjoy the lifestyle we have, because he could be like the, the, the chairman of the board of directors no, here. No, thank so you thank so you much. so much. We're going to enjoy your presentation, and we hope that you keep us updated all the time. I certainly do. Wow, thank you so much, Denise. I have to tell you guys, I'm kind of overwhelmed. Uh, first of all, it's an amazingly beautiful community. I mean, we've all heard of Sun City, but it didn't click in my mind like, oh, this is this huge and this beautiful, until, of course, I entered the grounds. And also, yeah, uh, I've done a lot of presentations. The book was released in April. Of course, I'm going to talk a lot about it, The Wisdom of Mori. I've done a lot of presentations. Uh, I mean, I did a lot of TV as well, but in terms of live presentations, I've done a lot, and this is the biggest. This is the most people for any single live presentation. I did a presentation at Newton Free Library. My, my parents lived in Newton, Massachusetts the last 30 or 40 years of his life. The library is actually directly next to the graves that both of, both of my parents are in now. My mom passed in 2021. And uh, the room was about this big, and the turnout is bigger here than in Newton, Massachusetts. <laughs> Basically, we'll break this down into four parts. We're going to start with the origin story of this book, because it's a very unusual origin story. We'll move on to how and why my father wrote it. And then we'll move on to the sort of two approaches in the book. So the origin story for me of this book starts in 1989. I had just returned to our house in Newton, Massachusetts um, in 1989. I had been traveling around Asia, lots and lots of countries, and we can talk about that. And I also lived in Asia for a very long time. But at this point, I was a young man, just graduated from college, and I've been traveling around Asia. And it's the last time that I ever lived with my parents in the same house, under the same roof, for any period of time. 
I, I was home for about three months, and it just happened to be the same period that my father was writing this manuscript, which turned into The Wisdom of Mori. So my dad and I had a very close relationship, and he was very eager to like bounce his ideas off me and ask me what he thought and how I perceived what he was saying and whether people he thought you know, I thought people would um, you know be able to to latch on to what he was saying. So we had very lively discussions about this book, and he was working on it. it was his main project. So he wrote this book from 1988 to 1992, um, mainly. 89 and 90. And then as the story continues, some of you will know, um, he started to become unwell, right? And at first, uh, it was very unclear what was wrong with him. You know, my father was always very light on his feet. For those of you that have read Tuesdays with Maury, you'll know he loved to dance. He was very much an incredibly energetic person, and I think that comes through in the wisdom of Maury. And he started to like stumble a little bit and not have as much energy. And of course, we had no idea what was wrong. And it took many, many tests and a long period, you know, a couple of years before uh, it was established that he had ALS. And that was in July of 1994. And the doctor told him that he had 12 to 18 months to live. So that's pretty heavy news. And by the way, the doctors were, were exactly right. He lived 16 months after that. Um, and then, as you know, um, he started talking about what it was like to have, you know, be living under a death sentence and what's important in life, at the end of your life, what's going to be valuable to you. And he started to get a lot of attention. Some of you may know this part of the story, some of you may not. But uh, the way that it started is that our hometown newspaper, the Boston Globe, sent a great uh, journalist who did um, human interest stories named Jack Thomas to the house. And he wrote a huge two parade spread about my dad. And um, one of the producers, one of the senior producers of Nightline with Ted Koppel was a Bostonian. And he happened to still receive the Boston Globe. And he saw the article. He said, why don't we put this guy on our show? And, a lot of you probably know it was a gigantic success. My father actually appeared three times on the show with Ted Koppel, which was very unusual for them. They usually only did one show on one topic. And um, Mitch saw the show and decided he needed to come back and see his old professor. If you've read Tuesdays with Maury, you'll know the story. They hadn't had any contact for 16 years. And Mitch felt very guilty about it. And he was just going to visit my dad once and say, you know, it was wonderful to have you as a professor so long. But because my father was so engaging and had so much to say, Mitch ended up coming for 14 weeks. And after my father passed away, turning it into Tuesdays with Maury. Um, and the book was published in 1997. So that means. I moved to Japan. My mother kept the house that the family lived in, that my father lived in. She kept his study exactly as it was um, when he lived there. She didn't throw anything out. And I used to go back and forth between Tokyo and Boston. I'm a journalist, so I would have articles that I needed to write while I was in Boston. I would sit at his desk and write my articles. And one day, I just decided to pull open a desk drawer to see what was inside. And I pulled, op pulled it open, and there was this big, bound manuscript. It wasn't loose leaf papers. It wasn't just typed. He had bound it with a big, hard, like cardboard, black cardboard cover. I mean, big, like this big. You know, The cover was way bigger than the typewritten pages. And I thought, what, what is this? And I opened it up, 
And I, of course, immediately knew what it was because I had talked with him so much about it, you know, more than 10 years, 15 years prior to this. So I discovered the manuscript and I realized like, oh, now we can do something with this because people know who my father is. In 1992, he wasn't, you know, a national figure. He wasn't well known. I added two essays, one at the beginning and one at the end. And the essays, pretty much, the first essay is about my dad and him writing this book, some of the stories that you've just heard. The second essay is more or less about my mother. When you read it, if you read it, I think you'll see how incredibly prescient it is. This book is written more than 30 years ago, and the issues that my father is talking about, I would say more or less, are just, being a, uh, just beginning to be discussed in our society, in American society. So. Um, he was a professor there for 30-something years, and when he turned 65 years old, the university came to him and suggested that he could retire. And of course, he wasn't interested in that at all. He said, no thanks. When they, ca they came to him three years later, when he was 68, they suggested he could retire, and he said, no thanks. They came to him when he was 70 years old, which was 1986, and said, yeah, you're going to retire now. <laughs> And he was not happy. The point is, is they forced him to retire, and it made him rethink a lot of things, including uh, how do people view him. He realized at age 70, people viewed him as someone who was aged, someone who was a senior. He never viewed himself that way, right? He was always full of life, full of energy, talking to people who were 50 years younger than him, and it didn't faze him in any way whatsoever. But he realized that people viewed him as someone you know, who was a senior, someone who was aging. And he had to take that on board. He also realized that he wasn't necessarily comfortable with that. And it was kind of a shock to him. This was a guy who really was you know, open-minded, open to all possibilities. And all of a sudden, he's like, oh, this is how people view me now. And he had to investigate himself. Why am I not really comfortable with this? So he realized the reason that he wasn't super comfortable with it is that we have all of this intense ageism in our society. And that people who are above a certain age just are no longer valuable or can no longer do anything or can no longer accomplish anything. And he thought, oh my god, this is so wrong. This is so much you know, poisonous for people and leading people in a completely wrong direction and is like one of those things in our society that has existed, but we just need to get rid of. So for example, one of the stories is a newspaper article about a man who has just graduated university at 95 years old and plans to become a doctor. <laughs> that's the kind of book it is, and that's the kind of message he's trying to get across. So of course, he set about to write this book and a lot of it, especially early in the book, is a discussion of ageism and the psychology of it and how poisonous it is. So much so that he coined his own term for a certain type of ageism. And that term that he coined is called age casting. And by age casting, he took this phrase from the film term typecasting, right? Where an actor is forced into one type of role and they can only play that role. Right? They can't expand their horizons and do anything else. They always have to play whatever it is, the bad guy or whatever. And he thought ageism was exactly the same type of thing, where people over a certain age are forced into this role of, OK, now your role is this, and this is all you can do. So there's two sections of the book, as I said. One is sort of more psychological, talking about how this uh, affects seniors and how uh, what society does. The other um, way that he writes and, and points that he makes in this book, um, and believe me, they're all woven together. It's not like these sections are, are different, um, is he actually offers direct techniques and things that he thinks will be helpful for aging people. As I've told you, he was like this really jovial, sort of happy figure, and he loved to laugh. And it just a, a, appeared to him that after a certain age, humor seemed to evaporate from people's lives. He thought that laughter was so important 
So he suggests that you, know, you find what is humorous, you find what makes you laugh, and you indulge in it as much as possible. Um, throughout my father's life, he was always interested in meditation. And he started to meditate when maybe he was in his 50s. But it became more and more important in his life. And then when he got ill, he really, really concentrated on it. And um, he wasn't one of these people that took to it immediately. Some people are like, oh, this is great. It was actually really hard for him. And I think it is really hard for most people. So don't think like, oh, I tried to meditate once. I couldn't do it. Forget it. He had to really work at it. The next three things are all, so that's two. The next three things are all related. They're, they're separate insights or techniques, but they're all related. So basically, my father felt that for seniors, it was really important to look at yourself and understand what interests you. There's a lot of other things about you that it's important to know about yourself, but in this, in this particular one, he's like, find out what you're really interested in and pursue that. One, two, three, four. Fourth one, if you like, um, is, uh, and this is also related to meditation, is that you need to focus your energy. Not be thinking about 10,000 things at once or unimportant things, but you know, you only have so much energy. All of us only have so much energy. So focus it on what's important to you. It's hopefully what you are interested in, what you're learning about, what's helping you grow, and also the most important relationships in your life. My father thought that relationships were like the key to life, the most important thing, so you need to focus on those relationships, whether they're familial or your friends or whatever, some people in your community, whatever it is. You need to focus on the things that are important and the relationships that are important in your life. So that is the fifth one. At the end of your life, on your deathbed, the size of your bank account is going to make absolutely no difference whatsoever. What you're going to remember and what's going to be valuable to you is the people in your life who you loved and who loved you and who you shared time with. So in other words, your relationships. The last one is very personal and my father means it as a very personal one. The sixth one, and my father came to this late in life, and I think this will resonate with a lot of people, is develop a spiritual connection. And as I said, it's a very personal one. My father was not prescribing in any way how or where or with whom you develop that connection. I love talking about my father. Um, I certainly hope that you get the book. I, I think that there's an incredible amount of valuable stuff in there. I'll talk just a couple of minutes about the book itself. Um, I was very involved in the design of this book. I wanted it to try and express my father's joy of life and living as much as possible. It's super colorful. It's tactile. There's actually raised text on the cover. And not only that, there's two things that I asked them to do in the design, and they did them both. One is color runs throughout the book. There are colored pages in the book. And somebody actually wrote a review right after the book came out saying, oh, I got a misprint. Some of my pages are a different color. It's like, no, that is intentional. Don't you get it? So now you all know. That is completely intentional. Not only that, I asked, and they um, uh, acceded to my request, that different types of writings be in different typefaces. So for example, some of the stuff that is like notes or things actually is in kind of a handwritten typeface. It's not actually handwritten, of course, but it looks handwritten. And there's all sorts of different typefaces to emphasize the different types of writing. And as I said, there's many different types of writing in this book. And this is very intentional to give you different points of view or different ways of thinking about things to break up the idea of, oh, I'm just reading a book about this. It's more like an experience, right? And that's also goes to the design of the book, why, why it was designed that way.